Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. My name's Lynn, and I'm the Director of Development at the Station North Tool Library. Uh, we're really excited to host you for the first installment of our new lecture series. Uh, Uh, many of you might be familiar with the tool library as a place to borrow tools and take classes on woodworking, crafting, home repair, all that good stuff. Uh, but a big part of our mission is to create a welcoming community space for the exchange of ideas. Uh, not just how to build things and use power tools, but ideas that encourage a deeper understanding of our city, our homes, and our community. So we're a nonprofit community-driven organization. We do our best to provide essential learning opportunities and resources for all people with as few barriers to access as possible. Um, the majority of our revenue comes from library membership, uh, classes, and our annual fundraising drive. If you like what we do, please support us in any or all of those ways. You can also spread the word if you have a friend or a neighbor who might benefit from what we do. Uh, we have an open house coming up on Friday, September 28th, if you want to support us by drinking at our next happy hour. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of our volunteers tonight who made the event possible. Um, there are so many, so I won't try to name them all. Uh, and a big shout out to Matt Crockett, who has volunteered to film the talk. Uh, the recording will be available online for anyone who wasn't able to be here tonight. Uh, if you're excited about this event and want to see more, please see one of our volunteers. They're in the Tool Library t-shirts. Uh, to donate. They can also help answer questions about classes, memberships, and upcoming events. Uh, last ones, I'd like to give a shout out to Area 405, gallery and event space that promotes arts and cultural programming in the Baltimore area, and a huge thanks to Union Craft Brewing for providing our drinks tonight. Last but not least, I uh, would like to thank Baltimore Heritage. They are a nonprofit dedicated to the preservation and promotion of our city's historic buildings and neighborhoods. Uh, they are co-sponsoring this event, and I'd like to introduce the wonderful Eli Poussin. Uh, he's the Director of Preservation and Outreach at Baltimore Heritage. In addition to being a historic preservation advocate and local historian, Eli has spoken across the country on this topic and many others. He will also be here for our next two lectures. Uh, which are researching your historic home or neighborhood on October 18th, and historic tax credits and resources for renovations on November 8th. So if you want to see more of Eli, come to either of those events. So without further delay, uh, please join me in welcoming Eli Poussin. Okay, well, welcome, welcome very much uh, to everyone. Is that a good distance? Does that sound right? The, did I do it closer? The, okay. The, uh, uh, my name is Eli Poussin. Um, I uh, do a lot of work related to historic buildings and neighborhoods um, uh, all across the city. I've done a, a good bit of work around vacant housing, uh, especially over the last couple of years, uh, around Project Core, which is a, a big program to fund the demolition of distressed vacant housing as, as well as the stabilization and acquisition of uh, vacant housing for development projects. And so tonight we are going to be talking about uh, vacant housing, we're going to be talking about uh, segregation, we're going to be talking about redlining, um, uh, we'll be talking about transportation, we'll be talking about inequality, we'll be talking about things that you may be an expert on, the, uh, uh, perhaps even more so than I am. So I would say that like the one thing that I always like to remind myself of is that not only are there like uh, uh, some wonderful people in this room who have experience fixing up uh, vacant houses, uh, uh, people who organize uh, development projects, people who organize uh, uh, legal actions to secure vacant land and vacant buildings. Um, uh, Make sure to talk to those folks after if you can if you can find them, and hopefully we'll we'll get folks to be asking questions and volunteering information as we go along, so that we can sort of uh, uh, have this be a bit more of a, a conversation where we where we all get to participate. Um, so just for like my slides and uh, some of the other stuff that I'm sharing this evening, including links to a lot of the things that we'll be looking at, are uh, uh, you can find them on Twitter at uh, the Vacants 101 hashtag, which is part of a longer ongoing project that we've been doing. So if you're interested in just getting a little bit more about this, you can you can check that out there. Um, so one of the other things that I think goes along with being everyone being sort of an expert on their own experience is that the risk is uh, is coming up here and uh, uh, presenting myself as some kind of like objective neutral observer sort of reporting down from on high the truth about uh, vacant houses and and 
say that that that's uh, not only would be not enjoyable for you all, but would be a uh, complete nonsense. No one can do that. So all I can do is speak to my own experience. And my own experience is, is living in and around vacant houses in, in Baltimore. Um, I see this vacant house every day. Um, it's uh, not on my block, but the next block over. Um, I would say not coincidentally, it's 400 East Lorraine, if you want to go take a look at it. Uh, better yet, if you've got some money burning a hole in your pocket and want to purchase this building and fix it up, uh, uh, let me know. The, uh, I've got no ownership interest, but just live right next door. And so when I think I'm not the only person who, uh, 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 on commutes, on walks, on um, just living in the city, sort of encounters vacant buildings in your daily life. So let's have a quick show of hands. How many folks, how many folks see a vacant, at least one or two vacant buildings on their commute? Raise your hand and sort of uh, keep it up. So take a quick look around. This is, this is a shared experience. They, so I guess then uh, uh, raise your hand if there's a uh, vacant building let's say uh let's say on your block let's see how many folks on your block okay so a smaller number of hands how, any and so this question is definitely optional but let's say anybody have a vacant building uh within a couple doors of their uh, of their house so a few so this is something that's important also to remember that it, it affects uh, some people differently than others. Some people who are living right next door to a vacant house are going to have a much different experience than someone living a block away. Someone who lives in a neighborhood where 35, 40% of the housing units are vacant is going to have a much different experience than someone living in a neighborhood with a much lower vacancy rate. Um, so, so if we've confirmed that we all have vacant houses on our bo uh, blocks, the next question to, to pose for you all is, uh, um, how, uh, how long do you think, so, so uh, I guess, raise your hand if you'd agree with the statement, Baltimore has a problem with vacant houses. Okay, yes, I think that this is something we can agree on, more, more common ground to, to build around. Um, uh, uh, raise your hand if you think that Baltimore has had a, uh, uh, raise your hand and keep it up if you think Baltimore has had a problem with vacant houses for at least 25 years. Okay, how about put, put your hand down if you think it's more recent than 50 years. Okay, 75, 100, 125. There's a few stalwarts among you who are like, this guy is a historian. And he's standing up in the front of the room telling us how long ago did this thing happen? He's obviously about to pull this one-two punch of here are the historical antecedents to our contemporary moment. And you were exactly right. The, because... Uh, <laughs> Because the truth is, is that uh, vacant housing, as I'll sort of like tell you again and again as we sort of go throughout the presentation, is not just a function of sort of people leaving the city and leaving houses behind being this sort of innocent, uh, just confusion. It's, it's really built into the fundamental structure of how the uh, housing market has developed around uh, race and segregation and inequality, and it's been something that's been going on since at least the 19th century, if not to the very beginning of sort of like Baltimore as a, as a city. Um, so one of the things that makes this a little bit complicated is that um, uh, sometimes it can be hard to figure out how many vacant houses we even have. So we all agree that we've got a problem. Um, does anyone know how many? I guess we've got the we've got the numbers up there. I can't I can't do a quiz on this one. The uh, um, so since the 1970s, Baltimore's uh, code enforcement office has maintained what they initially called a vacant house file as a database on the city's computer system. Back then, it was actually punch cards that they would process on a mainframe uh, that was sort of rented literally by the minute in order to gather and, and organize that data. Today, Baltimore Housing reports that the city has around 16,000 vacant buildings and 14,000 vacant lots, together around about 30,000 vacant properties. But if you use a different definition of what constitutes a vacant building, you get a different number, because what Baltimore Housing keeps track of is not unoccupied buildings, not even necessarily just distressed buildings, but vacant building notices. It's what's called an administrative data source, keeping track for that administrative purpose. So uh, the US Census Bureau counts vacant dwelling units. They come up with a number in 2010 of over 46,000. So a big difference between 16,000 and 46,000. Um, the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance tried to split the difference back in 2015 and came up with a number of about uh, uh, 31,000. So this challenge, you know, we, we agree we've got a problem. We can't quite agree on sort of how big that problem is. Unfortunately, the, the not only has do we have this long history of vacant buildings being a problem, we have this long history of not knowing what to do about the problem. So it, back in 
1965, in one of their reports, the Citizens Planning and Housing Association, which was a nonprofit advocacy organization first organized really to, to advocate for what was at the time called uh, slum, quote, quote, slum clearance and the, uh, even more urgently the construction of public housing. So CPHA in, in 1965 writes, no one person knows how many vacant houses are owned by the city, how many can be raised, how many have a known owner, how many are needed other uses, and how many are involved in some stage of the law enforcement process. So today we actually have a lot more data, but many people still don't know sort of where to find the data about the vacant houses on their block, or even sort of how to interpret that data once you know the facts about, say, uh, uh, is, it, is it in somewhere in the tax sale legal process, or is it being auctioned off for, uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, after a foreclosure. So moreover, sort of coming up with any effective and equitable solutions to the problems presented by vacant houses have been very hard to find. Um, in her 2015 report on the city's vacants to value program, uh, Joan Jacobson highlighted how Baltimore is, quote, identifying and cracking down on owners of derelict houses and scarred neighborhoods with plummeting property values. But she cautioned that the city offered few resources for neighborhoods outside priority areas with stronger housing markets. Since 2016, city staff, excuse me, prior from, uh, Prior to 2016, city staff have used the relative strength or weakness of a neighborhood housing market to decide which vacant buildings to demolish under the $700 million uh, uh, program known as Project Core. But this, uh, what's called a market typology, created by the Baltimore City Planning Department uh, um, first in 2004, bears a striking resemblance to the infamous redlining map drawn up 67 years earlier by the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation, or LLC. And so recent studies have uh, uh, confirmed that mortgage discrimination remains a major barrier to black and Latino home buyers over 50 years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. So the, the, uh, what we're really talking about here is that vacant houses are, uh, um, really tell a story about how racial and spatial inequality are built and maintained. The official count first top 16,000 properties at the outset of the national foreclosure crisis in 2008. And what's important to remember is that the buildings are the physical consequences of the decisions by people dedicated to preserving housing segregation, enacting transportation and land use policies that favor automobiles, and taxing and policing buildings in ways that stigmatize pro poverty. The concentration of these properties in historically segregated black neighborhoods in East and West Baltimore makes va vacant housing an urgent problem for tens of thousands of poor residents. Even more residents share the risks to both our individual and collective health and safety that are created by vacant and abandoned buildings. For the city, it reduces tax revenue to support public services, enforces the remaining occupied buildings, perhaps your house included, to bear a greater share of the costs. Ultimately, vacant buildings are a problem for, that affects everyone, whether or not they live in a neighborhood with a high vacancy rate. And so the, these, um, uh, the market conditions that we sort of I alluded to with the market typology, those are real. And they are the, 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 we can consider in many ways the prime structural barrier to the reuse of abandoned buildings, where the cost of rehabilitating and reusing that building in terms of labor, materials, uh, exceeds the cost that you would get from either selling that building to a homeowner or uh, turning it to a rental property. But that does not absolve those market conditions from being fundamentally built on a uh, racist history of, of segregation, discrimination, and inequality. And so this is why vacant buildings are a hard problem to solve. Elected officials have repeatedly proven unable or unwilling to engage with the question of how race, power, and inequality decide what happens to every house in the city. Um, the, instead, politicians and planners have consistently presented vacant buildings as the outcome of an inevitable natural problem rather than the result of these specific actions, choices, and policies that are shaped by white supremacy and structural inequality. So the, uh, um, <laughs> the uh, you know, I think that the mayor, well, I found this to be something that I didn't want my mayor to be saying, uh, as she remarked, uh, what the hell, we should just take all this, and I think it's shit, but I didn't have confirmation of that, they didn't play it in the recent TV report, so just as a historian, I could not just write in shit question mark, I, so, so I just published it the same way I got it in the transcript. The, uh, so the, um, uh, uh, but ultimately, this sort of throwing up of hands, of this is, look at this mystery, you know, just, just get rid of it. So why do we have so many videos?
houses. And of course, this is, this is the, the first explanation that, um, that most folks uh, start with. Um, when, uh, uh, so this, of course, showing the population of Baltimore City from 1940 to uh, uh, 2010. And when, in my experience, when elected officials or the staff representing Baltimore Housing or the city planning agencies at community meetings seek to explain the city's problem with vacant houses, the story goes something like this. Over the past six decades, Baltimore City has lost population. In 1950, 950,000 people lived in the city. 60 years later, the population had dropped by 325,000 people. In the decades after World War II, the city lost thousands of industrial jobs for the suburbs to increased automation into southern, often anti-union states. But the problem with focusing primarily on the city's post-war population loss is the way it treats the problems of abandonment and neglect as inevitable and natural. When you talk about too many old houses and too, many, too few people, you try to present a housing market that's disconnected from culture, public policy, and politics. This story is not one that seeks to hold anyone responsible for the problem. So I, you can see parallels between how we talk about vacant housing and ruin porn, as, as it's sometimes called, a sort of a c consumer oriented visual culture of, uh, of abandonment and neglect. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'll say I love uh, photos of falling down old buildings more than most folks, so perhaps I'm complicit in this too. But uh, uh, Dora Apple writes that ruin images are meant to soothe and domesticate the sense of brokenness, fragmentation, and violence at the core of ruination. They're meant to sort of get you to hit like on Facebook rather than going like, damn, this is, this is someone's home that is just full of heartbreak now. Uh, the popularity and wide distribution of these images tells people that Detroit or Baltimore's uh, uh, abandonment, the physical deterioration of buildings, and the financial precarity of the city is, again, inevitable. And even worse, such images might reinforce a narrative that puts blame on the city's largely black residents rather than on the uh, white and sometimes also black elected officials, policymakers, and business leaders who have shaped the policies that continue to drive abandonment in the present day. So let's tell a more complete story. Um, starting with, so let's, a uh, uh, quick show of hands. I will, I will uh, raise my hand first to say I grew up in the suburbs uh, uh, about, uh, I guess, sort of lower portion of Montgomery County, right outside of DC. So, um, so I definitely identify as a person who grew up in the suburbs. I guess raise your hand real quick if you identify as someone who grew up in the city. I'll keep my hand down. So a few folks, raise your hand if you identify as someone who grew up in the suburbs. Raise your hand, I guess, if you uh, identify as someone who grew up in a place that you wouldn't call either the city or the suburbs. The, uh, um, so you can see if we looked back, uh, um, uh, I guess if we looked back 150 years, depending on sort of like where I was talking, certainly a large portion of the population would be, would be rural, but we're at a point now where most folk, many, many people have grown up in the suburbs. And we are more or less uh, aware, depending on our sort of, did we take an urban history class in, in college mainly, um, the extent to which that sort of process of sur suburbanization was deeply subsidized by the federal government. So between 1950 and 1970, the population of Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County 1950 and 1970, 20-year period, more than doubled from 387,000 and change to 690,000 and a bit. In that same 20-year period, that's when Baltimore's population began to fall for the first time, losing over 40,000 residents by 1970. And simultaneously, black residents increased as a share of the city's population from 24% to 46%, while the segregated development of the suburbs led the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights to hold hearings on the zoning and planning process in Baltimore County by 1970. Um, as Baltimore uh, City lost residents, the surrounding counties gained both population and jobs. So new homes that were being built, uh, um, let's see if we got, yes. Um, so new homes being built out in the suburbs attracted residents who might otherwise live in existing homes in Baltimore City. Similarly, the movement of new factories and shopping malls uh, brought employment opportunities to the suburbs, but limited access for, uh, to employment for city residents. And uh, uh, whether it was through the uh, um, uh, Department of Transportation sort of funding that would uh, enormously subsidize the construction of uh, 
695 and I-83, or even more significantly, the millions and millions of dollars that went into mortgage aid through the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration that were gen uh, only accessible to uh, uh, white borrowers and uh, due to both internal Federal uh, Housing Administration policies and uh, persistent discrimination around conventional mortgage lending. So this brings us to the sort of main main attraction of uh, of uh, our uh, uh, discussion today it is really to dive into the way in which the history of vacant houses is bound up with the history of racism, segregation, and uh, inequality. And so the these range from uh, the sort of notorious red line in the 1930s, which was a sort of uh, uh, policy we'll talk more about in just a moment, up through the blockbusting in the 1950s and 1960s of sort of different uh, varieties or contract buying in the same period, uh, varieties of exploitative um, uh, real estate practices that had disproportionate effects on uh, black households, black property owners, and majority black neighborhoods. So as a result of these policies, um, you certainly most best known for the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which if folks aren't, how many folks have, uh, uh, is anyone encountering a HULC map? Has anyone not seen this map before? Raise your hand if this is your first introduction to this map. So really, okay, let's slow down for just a moment. Excellent. The, um, uh, so I think this is the kind of thing that someone who studies urban history, I'm like, this is old hat, everybody will know this, and then I'm like, oh, maybe not, maybe not. So one of the fascinating things, just the the internet geek in me uh, uh, chiming in along with the history geek in me. The, uh, there's been a tremendous explosion in uh, interest, uh, sort of both public and popular interest, and um, uh, scholarly interest in the history of the homeowners loan corporation and uh, their uh, what they would call their residential security maps since people have actually been able to see their ima these images with their own eyes. This program was created in the midst of the Great Depression to be able to get people back to buying houses again. It was something uh, that uh, uh, where fit people who worked for the Federal Housing Administration, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, worked with local real estate agents, I believe exclusively white. Actually, at the time, uh, the sort of National Board of Realtors uh, barred an, any admission to, uh, to black uh, 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 Realty agents. I'm trying to. I think is it, is it a realtist was the competing uh, um, association for black uh, uh, property owners because the National Board of Realtors had like cop copyrighted the name realtor. So if you were a black person who wanted to sell houses, um, then you couldn't call yourself a realtor without risking legal action at the time. So a little bit of a sidebar note there. But so to class the city, uh, not just Baltimore, but. Uh, 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 I think in excess of 80 cities around the country, sort of dividing them up into different grades, A, B, C, and D, and uh, uh, making those determinations based primarily on the uh, people who were living in the neighborhood and uh, um, uh, the, uh, primarily the racial and religious and ethnic makeup of, uh, of those neighborhoods. Um, and so it, uh, you can see the, the redlining, of course, gets its name from the areas that are marked in red, where it would be basically impossible, whether you were a landlord or a homeowner, to get a uh, mortgage loan or to get any kind of loan to make improvements on your house. So cutting off that supply of finance saying um, money, saying you cannot, other people can get money to fix up their houses or buy houses, you cannot, um, uh, dramatically had reinforced existing patterns of inequality that were already in place, but dramatically accelerated the, uh, the uh, disinvestment from these areas. And, and what we end up seeing is because those red areas are um, uh, sort of co-located with uh, uh, what was already the sort of um, uh, historically segregated uh, parts of Baltimore City, I should say, all of Baltimore was historically segregated. Those are the areas that were historically occupied by uh, uh, largely black households. Um, and so you can see the way in which those patterns are actually still replicated today. I'm going to pull over real quick a... Um, so I, I just put this on Twitter this afternoon, so if you wanted to check this out uh, later, 
kind of like an interactive thing. I'll probably keep making tweaks to it so it looks a little better. But right now we're looking at the, uh, uh, these are just vacant building notices. I think the from the last four years, maybe slightly longer than that, it's a, uh, um, uh, a layer that Baltimore Housing provides called their new vacant building notices. And what we're looking at is, interestingly, the, the overlap between the, um, the A grade, the best uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, or I shouldn't say best, the neighborhoods with the strongest housing market in the uh, 2017 housing market typology um, compared to the neighborhoods that have the lowest grade within the HOLC designation. And so they actually overlap in, um, uh, I guess, a couple places down in sort of South Baltimore and a little bit in Midtown because that area would have uh, been entirely red. Of course, these patterns aren't like 100% exact because you can see if I, if I turn back on the, uh, uh, all the, the layers for the, the HOLC, uh, grades here, you have substantial numbers of uh, vacant buildings located in areas that were graded yellow or graded blue. Um, so the HOLC was not necessarily destiny, but it certainly was something that uh, was shaping a lot of these early um, considerations around sort of like what was going to happen with the growing number of, uh, of vacant houses in, in Baltimore City. So. Um, so the, the consequence being that uh, today, um, uh, the average vacancy rate in 2013 in neighborhoods where less than 50% of residents are black is 2.54%. And the rate in uh, uh, neighborhoods where more than 80% res of residents are black is over 13%. Um, in comparison, Baltimore City's total average vacancy rate is about 8%. And so the, the, I mention this not to... Um, uh, uh, so I, th and I'll just mention also this, this is based on an analysis of data from the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. And so I'll, I'll link to where you can find that kind of information at the, at the end. But um, it's not intended to be stigmatizing for uh, either black residents or majority black neighborhoods, but rather to, to highlight, to reemphasize you'll hear me do again and again, the disproportionate effect of vacancy on Baltimore's black residents and their neighbors. Um, so what's fascinating to me about all this, though, and the, uh, is that the extent to which vacant houses actually have a much longer history in Baltimore than many people realize. So as early as 1831, 1831, newspaper publisher Hezekiah who published the equivalent of what was like the Wall Street Journal for the early 19th century, um, wrote about the connection between employment and housing demand in Baltimore, explaining how the, quote, one of employment after the panic of 1819 caused a quote, con consequent removal of the people to the north, south, east, and west. But with uh, capital investment from uh, wealthy white men like Niles, together with the labor from recent European immigrants, enslaved people of African descent, and free people of color, Baltimore grew quickly, doubling the population actually between 1830 and 1850. And so beginning in 1844, you have uh, private rail companies beginning to, to uh, run horse-drawn omnibus lines out from the dense city center out to the edges of Baltimore County. And after the Civil War, large property owners all around the city took advantage of these new rail lines to build thousands of suburban houses to sell or rent to affluent white Baltimoreans. So local builders actually constructed about 3,000 houses each year between 1885 and 1887, but this was a pattern of overbuilding that left many houses uh, standing empty after the, uh, another financial panic in 1893. A writer for The Sun complained, other cities have endeavored to make capital of reports of the very large number of vacant houses in Baltimore, claiming it as an evidence that this city is falling behind. The, uh, um, at the same time, uh, vacant houses were primarily a secondary concern for city officials who were much more interested in uh, uh, regulating and hopefully for them profiting from the growing number of occupied houses being built in uh, the large part of Baltimore County annexed into the city in 1888. So in 1893, you have the city laying out a new uh, a building code, the sort of first modern building code um, that gave the city's inspector of buildings the power to tear houses down. This is sort of the, the first time that the city could come along and, and take a house down, even if it was owned by a, a private property owner. The, um, in the early 20th century, however, um, uh, we reached this moment where, uh, where white residents in um, in west and northwest Baltimore, sort of to orient folks, this is the, the inner harbor down there. You can see if you look uh, straight up here, the Washington Monument, 
And so to the left of the Washington Monument, sort of, or you could go like straight up from the Bromo Seltzer Tower here, you're looking at what uh, uh, Baltimore City looked like at the early 20th century. Um, at this moment where white residents in what had been in the 1860s and 1870s, the sort of like far out suburbs, the sort of Hunt Valley of the immediate post-Civil War era, if you uh, uh, will forgive the metaphor, um, that uh, they were really getting worried about vacant buildings. Because weakening demand among white tenants and homeowners for older houses in that part of the city left a growing number of buildings in the area empty. And so uh, in, um, on McCullough Street, uh, over in uh, what's now uh, uh, Druid Heights, or on Gilmore Street over in Harlem Park or around Upton, um, property owners who uh, sought to rent or sell their houses to Baltimoreans were undermining the efforts of their uh, uh, the remaining white residents who were seeking to maintain sort of strict boundaries of racial segregation. And we're sort of a uh, 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 we're not going to do the whole history of like how racial segregation developed in in cities, but suffice to say, it was still a relatively new concept. It was something that they were trying to figure out how do we how do we as a as a city make this work. We want to have segregation. How do we do it? The uh, um, so in this uh, 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 sort of mood of trying to figure out sort of like how do we, how do we achieve this goal, um, in August of 1910, the Baltimore Police Board released a complete census of the number of houses both vacant and occupied in the city, completed at the request of William Martien and Company, which was a 40-year-old local real estate firm that I'll mention actually also contributed to the eventual design of the HOLC uh, uh, redlining map. The survey found over 1,300 vacant dwellings in the Northwestern District, about one quarter of the uh, 5,600 vacant buildings found across the city. So James Carey uh, uh, Mart Martien, the son of the firm's founder, um, argued that vacancy was caused by both the, quote, many dwellings being built in the suburbs and the, quote, dilapidated conditions of many dwellings in Baltimore. But in a telling omission, of course, Martin's analysis of supply and demand neglected to acknowledge the growing role of racial segregation in shaping the regional housing market. So a series of letters actually illustrates some of the, the concerns, the relationship between vacant buildings and racial segregation. So one letter from August 25th, uh, signed Pure White, is pretty, pretty direct. When an old man works and saves and buys a home thinking it will be his shelter in his old age and wakes up some morning to find he has a Negro neighbor, he feels hurt and grieved that he has to give up his home, but he moves. The real estate men, a few of them, not all, are to blame for the vacant houses, and with them lies the remedy. Days later, another writer echoed this sentiment and demanded that elected officials, let's see, demanded that elected officials, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry about that, um, protect his neighborhood against what he saw as the threat of black neighborhoods and vacant houses. There are ver several vacant houses in the block, and this fear of, quote, Negro invasion may be the potent cause of non rental or sale. Each vacant house is a standing menace to the rest. So panicked segregation in Northwest Baltimore breathed a huge sigh of relief on December 19, 1910, when Baltimore City's mayor signed into law the nation's very first municipal ordinance requiring racially segregated housing on a block-by-block -block basis, designating some blocks to be white blocks and other blocks to be white block, uh, 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 white blocks and black blocks. Um, of course, this created an immediate puzzle for the blocks in which both white and black people lived, of which there were several, the uh, um, uh, less than you might necessarily think. And of course, I think some of the residents of those blocks flew under the radar. One of the first arrests made under this law was actually a white woman living in the vicinity of where Lexington Market is now. Uh, I found that account in the Afro-American where I think there was a good deal of satisfaction that this, uh, uh, this policy was sort of blowing back on, if not, if not the individuals who were creating it, at very least someone who, who looked like them. Uh, um, uh, of course, this 1910 ordinance, uh, less than a month later, judges on the Supreme Bench of Baltimore City voided the ordinance on a technicality, but the City Council was not, not dissuaded. They quickly passed a replacement and then immediately revoked that because they felt like that might face some legal challenges too, and finally a third version of May of 1911. Mm -hmm. So in, in June of 1913, W. B. Hawkins, who was a local black lawyer living at the time at 529 
Rockland Street, went to court to defend Reverend John H. Gurry, who was the black pastor of uh, King's Apostle Holy Temple, which was a, a church. Gurry faced criminal charges after he had moved his church to 581 Lawrence Street. This is sort of about a uh, half block. Uh, uh, east of Pennsylvania Avenue um, in sort of the, um, if you if are familiar with Lawrence Street and Bolton Hill, you or it continues all the way west for quite a while. So, uh, um, so about where Pennsylvania Avenue and Lawrence cross. And what the police had determined, often, of course, the, the individual officers were sort of like, if they didn't have the, their map with them, they were just going to make a sort of seat of the pants decision. So this officer had declared this to be a white block under the segregation law. Um, and so that June, Hawkins won Curry's case and overturned the law. Um, and four years later, in 1917, the US Supreme Court decision uh, in a, a case called Buchanan Cannon versus War Worley overturned a similar ordinance in Louisville, Kentucky, and ruled municipal segregation laws unconstitutional. This was a, a victory brought to uh, American citizens by, by black lawyers and courageous black uh, 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 plaintiffs. And so in that case, Hawkins actually submitted an amicus brief on behalf of Worley uh, as part of his work for the Baltimore chapter of the NAACP. So unsurprisingly, the white residents wasted no time in uh, finding other strategies to um, uh, pursue uh, the goal of racially segregated neighborhoods, uh, certainly not, not limited solely to, to legal ones, as this uh, comic in the Afro-American illustrates a, a mob of men uh, stoning the, uh, what's labeled in the comic, uh, home of a colored citizen. One of numerous incidents that took place of the uh, vandal, uh, vandalization and threatening of black households that were uh, moving into what were uh, at the time being treated as, uh, as uh, a quote unquote white neighborhoods. Um, more significantly, residents formed protective associations and adopted racially restrictive housing covenants. Um, and so, but as the city continued to grow and suburbanize in the 1920s, the color line uh, at the edges of older segregated black neighborhoods remained unstable. And white Baltimoreans kept moving even farther out of the city, continuing to leave vacant buildings behind. And so by the outset of the Great Depression, the economic, national economic crisis left thousands of property owners holding on to uh, falling down buildings that they, they couldn't afford to fix up. And, the, uh, and you have hundreds and hundreds of buildings going up for auction for unpaid taxes that are then getting acquired by Baltimore City. And so as early as 1937, the Baltimore Sun observed that the housing problem that confronted Baltimore was, quote, growing worse ever since the motor vehicle came into general use, which enabled people to move away from congested surroundings into the suburbs. They saw this, quote, natural movement as inevitable. And they grimly concluded that when districts were de largely deserted for residence purposes, real estate values rapidly deteriorated, vacant buildings went from bad to worse, and the blight set in. So plans to address the abundance of vacant buildings shaped the site selection and design process for slum, quote unquote, slum clearance projects in the 1930s, the development of public housing in the 1940s and 1950s, and the designation and implementation of urban renewal from the uh, 50s all the way up through the 1980s. Moreover, these projects, although they were certainly took down a, a large numbers of vacant buildings, they also required the traumatic displacement of black tenants, homeowners, churches, businesses, and community institutions from those houses, churches, and commercial structures that were occupied in many of these uh, same areas. So resistance to uh, uh, displacement um, is uh, uh, sort of most visible around the sort of highway proposals that were uh, 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 being planned and built between the 1940s and 1980s. So the Baltimore Beltway, for example, opened in stages around the city between 1955 and 1962. How many folks have uh, rid, uh, taken a drive on uh, I-695 uh, uh, before? So what you, so I was gonna say, there is not that many hands. Uh, this, is why, this is why we're doing another hand raising exercise halfway in. It's like, I've been quoting from, uh, from dry historical texts for like a solid 15 minutes now. So everyone we're sort of nodding off. It's getting a little warm in here. We can, we can also, once we, uh, uh, if we all start to melt, we can turn the fan back on. The, uh, so uh, uh, the Baltimore Beltway opened alongside what we sort of already mentioned were these sort of discriminatory policies around zoning.
planning patterns um, that actually resulted in a decline in the uh, share of Baltimore County's black population in that same period. And not only sort of avoided the location of any public housing in Baltimore County, largely avoided the construction of uh, uh, apartment buildings outside of small areas of Dundalk for uh, uh, much of the, the up through, the, I think, the 1970s and 1980s is when some of those policies began to change. And of course, in a, in a uh, city where you have uh, widespread and consistent uh, 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 discrimination in areas of employment and education and wages. The, the defining factor here is that uh, um, uh, race, wealth, and income often are correlated factors in, in uh, Baltimore, which is to say that if you wanted to keep black people out of Baltimore County, you could keep poor people out and, and you would be probably achieving your goal. In a lot in a lot of cases, at any rate, the, that wasn't sufficient because uh, it certainly took more than more than just that. The Relocation Action Movement, which was established in 1966 uh, in West Baltimore, and the Movement Against Destruction, which was a citywide organization, delayed plans for the construction of the East-West Expressway, which you see part of the 1960 design for that uh, here, overlaid with 2018 vacant building notices. The um, the uh, uh, of course, they delayed, but were unable to stop, beginning in 1975, the construction of I-170, also known as the Highway to Nowhere, or uh, historically the Franklin Mulberry Ex Expressway, which cut a swath of destruction across central West Baltimore. So the emerging sort of, um, uh, yeah, I'll just keep going. The, uh, there's asides on basically every single one of these slides, so I'll, I'll save my asides until we get to close to the end. The, um, the emerging political significance of tearing down vacant houses as a, as a solution to the problems of, uh, of many city neighborhoods is illustrated in March of 1964 when Theodore McKeldin announced plans to speed up the demolition of vacant and city-owned houses in areas that were cited for these new schools, highways, and urban renewal projects. Um, this announcement came less than two weeks after the publication of a report by the Baltimore Urban Renewal and Housing Authority identifying uh, uh, that um, uh, 119 vacant houses of, in city ownership that made up about 10% of the more than 12,000, uh, excuse me, 1,200 vacant houses in poor condition spread out across city blocks. And so the city is increasingly being called to account for their own ownership and neglect of vacant buildings. Um, McKeldin, in responding to this and announcing the demolition, emphasized the risks associated with vacant houses, saying vacant houses not only have a blighting effect on areas around them, but they are also an open invitation to vandals and a potential hazard to children who attempt to attempt to play within such buildings. And so this, this year, they uh, um, really began to speed up the, the demolition process. It's certainly not Demolition wasn't the only thing um, uh, going on in the 1960s and 1970s um, because the city was, as it, as it remains today, often creative and innovative in trying to figure out what to do with housing issues in our neighborhoods. And so homesteaders uh, rehabilitated hundreds of vacant houses through the famed Dollar House program in neighborhoods like Berry Circle, uh, uh, Ridgely's Delight, um, Otterbein, uh, and um, uh, Sterling Street over in Old Town. Um, yet this and other alternatives, which also included the scattered site public housing program where uh, 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 vacant buildings were acquired and rehabilitated and then managed directly as rental units by the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. They couldn't match the broad scale of demolitions. So between 1970 and 1990, you have over 17,000 units of vacant housing torn down. The, the city intermittently sort of tried strategies for addressing vacancy on a broader scale, but in 1993, the city counted 6,974 vacant houses, which was actually an increase of 800 houses since 1981, despite those decades of uh, uh, demolition. The, those uh, uh, two decades from 1970 to 1990 also saw the city lose uh, nearly an, another 170 thousand residents at the same time that the overall metropolitan region gained over 300,000. So the, the 1980s, I think the, as, a, as someone who was a uh, kid in the 1980s, I think it took me a, a little while to, uh, to come around to a firm understanding of just how damaging um, uh, Reagan's policy 
policies were to uh, many American cities, uh, Baltimore included. And of course, it was a bit of a one-two punch of financial austerity under first Nixon and then uh, uh, later Reagan cutting many of the programs that had been put in place under President Johnson for the war on poverty that were having a demonstrable positive impact on lifting people uh, out of poverty and improving a, a variety of sort of uh, uh, conditions around sort of public welfare. Um, uh, these were, these, many of these were brutally cut. Uh, you know, in 1985, you have Maryland's savings and loan crisis, and the city set a new record of 8,600 tax delinquent properties that went up for uh, tax sale auctions in 1987. And at the same time that we've got this, like, newly energized, bigger than ever problem of vacant buildings, we have less money to deal with it. Uh, we, there was a sharp decline of building inspections from over 43,000 in 1989 to about 33,000 just two years later. Violation notices dropped from 27,000 to 20,000. So the, even ag acknowledging the fact that code enforcement itself was, was part of the sort of the system of racism and inequality within the housing market, you also, uh, uh, you don't even have a, um, uh, even that system is is sort of breaking down under the sort of conditions of austerity. And so the, uh, you know, this has been a fascinating subject of research for me as a, uh, someone who loves old buildings. And my job is trying to keep old buildings standing. But I can clearly see that vacant buildings can be a source of great harm to uh, uh, my neighbors to, to neighbors halfway across the city. And certainly these, the concerns of the harm that vacant buildings were doing to neighborhoods has been something that we've been talking about for a long time. So Baltimore, then Baltimore Police Commissioner Edward V. Woods heard demands for demolition from at least one in June of 1992 when he visited the 900 block of East Biddle Street, sort of over a little bit east of the jail. Um, the, uh, when he was there meeting the family of a three-year-old boy, Andre, Andre Antonio Dorsey, who had been killed by a stray bullet two days earlier. Regardless of any planned police response, the boy's mother, Felicia Dorsey, was ready to leave the neighborhood, saying, even if the police do try to do something more in the neighborhood, I'm not planning on even staying around to see it. I'm moving. On a brief walk around the block, Commissioner Woods met a 20-year-old neighbor, Denise Lewis, who offered the commissioner some advice. Tear all these rotten houses down and build the kids a playground. I'll note that while the demolition was, uh, was embraced, uh, uh, funding for uh, recreation and parks uh, was on a steep and consistent decline from the 1980s through the, through the early aughts. So I feel like perhaps uh, um, uh, many people, when they heard uh, Denise Lewis uh, say, all these rotten houses down and build the, the kids a playground. They stopped after they got to tear all these rotten houses down and just, it was like, good idea. Let's just go right that way. The, um, uh, you know, it's hard. Even tearing down vacant houses is a hard thing to do. It's not easy. You can make mistakes. It's very expensive. In 1993, Mayor Kurt Schmoke, Baltimore's first elected black mayor, promised to renovate or demolish 600 vacant houses in Sandtown, Winchester within a single year. The next year, then uh, uh, a Baltimore Housing Commissioner, Dan, Dan Henson, made the case for demolition in an interview with the Baltimore Sun saying, what I'm hearing from communities is, if they're given two short-term options, a vacant house or a vacant lot, they'll take the latter every day. When I lay out the criteria and ask them to work with us on a selective demolition plan, they're saying it's like they're throwing us a lifeline. Uh, uh, Mayor Schmoke shared Henson view, Henson's view saying, if we have vacant houses that are sitting nuisances in the neighborhood, I want to tear them down. So the, I sort of am struggling still, even after I uh, talk about this again and again, with the, the idea that while well, it's clear that vacant and abandoned housing is a symptom of these broader systemic problems that we've been talking about, automobile center development and racial segregation sort of foremost among them, the hazards, financial costs, and stigma largely affect people who are living nearby. So people who are living nearby uh, vacant buildings worry about uh, their own safety and the safety of their neighbors. And so the, uh, 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 these people, of course, included folks like Thomas Lemon. Uh, so on March 28th, 2016, Thomas Lemon, a 69-year-old retired truck driver, sat in his prize Cadillac parked next to a 110-year-old vacant brick row house on Payson Street in the West Baltimore neighborhood of Midtown Edmondson. You can see it right at the end of the row here, the, the, the house at any rate. 
The first owners of this house, which was built back in 1906, Jacob Bowerman and his wife lived there up until they sold it in 1948. Probably coincidentally, the same year the US Supreme Court's decision in Shelley versus Kramer made racial restrictive covenants unenforceable. In 1973, the house was sold in, in tax sale um, uh, and was abandoned sometime in the 1990s, maybe early aughts, sold at tax sale again, but the buyer never finalized the purchase, and so the building languished. At the time of its uh, uh, collapse, um, folks, no one had been taking care of it for, for years and years. Every day he would come out and sit in that car, relax and listen to music, said Lemon's cousin Robert English. But that afternoon, high winds pushed over the two-story wall of the vacant row house at 900 North Payson Street. A pile of bricks dropped onto Lemon's car, killing him. So what are we doing about vacant houses today? Two years after uh, Lemon's death, on March uh, 27th, uh, 2018, this, this, this past spring, uh, our mayor, Catherine Pugh, and uh, Governor Larry Hogan held a, a press conference in front of six boarded up vacant houses on the thousand block of North Stock Stockton Street in Sandtown, Winchester, dating all the way back to the 1880s, I believe. Hogan used it, this occasion to announce the newest phase of Project CORE, the planned demolition of 500 additional abandoned buildings that his press release labeled, quote, a haven for criminal activity in neighborhoods most at risk. The list included 75 vacant buildings in Midtown Ed the Midtown Edmondson neighborhood where Thomas Lemon died. Beyond demolition, however, Hogan offers few solutions for West Baltimore residents struggling to live around vacant buildings. In 2014, Hogan abruptly canceled the Red Line, an east-west light rail, light rail line project that had secured over $900 million in federal funding just a year before construction was start, scheduled to begin. Hogan then redirected state funding for public transportation towards expanding highways in suburban and rural counties. Before the end of the year, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and ACLU of Maryland had filed an administrative complaint with the U.S. Department of Transportation Office of Civil Rights on behalf of the Baltimore Regional Initiative Developing Genuine Equality, or BRIDGE. Citing the long history of inequitable transportation policy in Baltimore and Maryland as the basis for their claim. In July 2017, uh, not coincidentally after the election of Donald Trump, uh, the office closed the complaint without any explanation or substantive response. In 2018, when Hogan sat down, uh, uh, you can see he's not too well, but he's in the cab there, his hand being guided by a more experienced and presumably licensed uh, 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 operator. The, uh, uh, when Hogan sat down at the controls of that John Deere excavator and with help from a contractor, started tearing down those six houses on Stockton Street, the city had shared a proposal to replace the vacant buildings with a new park, but the city had not yet made a plan to pay for it. Those houses disappeared uh, into trucks and dumpsters within just a few days. The, the brick wall on Payson Street took just a moment to fall on Thomas Lemon. Coming up with a lasting solution to the problem of vacant houses is going to take a lot longer. Um, of course, we can see this, this is where we would now be seeing the red line well under uh, uh, construction if uh, the project had not been canceled. Um, so the, the issue being that uh, even when you take these houses down as this sort of uh, series of uh, 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 small row houses being deconstructed on East Hoffman Street, um, likely er very early 20th century, sort of uh, uh, right by Greenmount Cemetery. Um, uh, and as the houses disappear, you can see there's another vacant house waiting right behind it. The uh, uh, demolition alone is unlikely to solve the, the, the problems of, uh, of houses in, in uh, uh, Baltimore City because we, we don't have the money to pay for it. And I, I mean, I'm not sure that we should even if we could. So to, to wrap up, um, let's see, how much time do we have left? Um, yes, to wrap up. The, uh, um, so what can you do about this? So I don't want to end on this big downer of uh, Hogan canceled the red line. You know, everything is, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have over 16,000 vacant building notices. Uh, uh, it can be a intractable, frustrating, and difficult problem. Um, you can suffer the indignities of diminished public services from Baltimore city government as a result of uh, diminished uh, uh, tax revenue or outdated uh, um, uh, sort of policy frameworks. And you can just 
just say, ah, man, this, this is terrible. I'm going to move the, to the county. Well, I will tell you, that does not solve the problem of vacant houses. The, uh, um, so if you are interested in solving the problem of vacant houses, certainly people all across the region do play a role. But I think living in the city is a big part of it. The, uh, um, so things you can do. Uh, use the uh, uh, brand new uh, uh, Baltimore 311 website and app recently relaunched. It's now at Balt City, uh, Balt 311.baltimorecity.gov. Uh, one of the uh, nice additions to the uh, app that's literally just a week and a half old is now you can report a request a housing inspection for a vacant residential property, which previously you had to submit under the other category. So this is this is a, a, a constructive step for you being able to uh, to try to uh, trigger a visit from the uh, city code enforcement officers. Um, you can do something as simple as discouraging predatory investors by taking down we buy houses signs, which are often used by uh, um, uh, individuals who uh, are trying to find a uh, seller who is um, I think they call them motivated sellers, but one otherwise might say a seller that's at a severe disadvantage because uh, they don't have a lot of money. And so they can um, uh, sell a, a, a smart investor, can get folks who are in a bad position to sell their houses for even less than they might otherwise get for them. And of course, this is the most common use of this advertising technique. In the background, you see a project core demolition cluster. So that, that uh, is at Lafayette and Argyle, and those houses are now gone. You can also, if you like, well, there's a vacant building in my neighborhood, and I've got no idea who owns it. I don't know how long it's been vacant for. I'm not sure what to do about that. I will point you to CodeMap. This is a, a, a web-based GIS application that's maintained by Baltimore Housing. If you just Google Baltimore CodeMap, it'll come right up. Um, the, uh, it, this allows you to access almost all of the same data that the uh, city uses to make decisions about uh, demolition, rehabilitation, uh, acquisition, disposition. Um, Highlighted here is the the, uh, the vacant building notice uh, data for the uh, neighborhood that we're in, Green Mount West, and the adjoining neighborhood of Charles North. Um, that's actually, since this is, of course, the current data, it's a substantial decline since Vacants to Value launched in 2015, one of actually just a few neighborhoods that have uh, experienced a really sharp decline in the number of uh, vacant building notices through that, through that program. You can also help promote and market your neighborhood. You can have fun living in your neighborhood, and you can pat yourself on the back for uh, enhancing the quality of life for yourself and your neighbors and then uh, uh, creating an incentive for people to stay in that community and continue to build their lives in that community. You can learn more about your neighbors and, and your neighborhood using the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance Community Profiles, which is something that mentioned I, I used in the, the uh, uh, coming up with this study. You can advocate for affordable housing and equitable development. And I know there's folks with Baltimore Housing Roundtable here tonight. I, we've got a, if you turn, raise your, that hand again. So see right there, if you want to talk to somebody about the Baltimore Housing Roundtable, which in partnership with United Workers and the Community Develop, uh, Maryland, Community Develop, Community Development Network of Maryland, or community, just community, community development network just secured millions of dollars in new public funding for the construction of affordable housing over the next several years in uh, Baltimore City. And of course, you can continue to advocate for affordable housing and equitable development at the federal level. If you're interested in keeping up with the uh, the horror show, which is uh, the Department of Housing uh, and Urban Development right now, I would direct you to Carson Watch. They have a, a Facebook page as well as a website supported by a great group of, uh, of partners that do advocacy work around housing, poverty, and, and race. Um, so I think, though, that if, I, if you leave here with nothing else, I would, I would ask you to um, consider if you have ever used the word blight or blighted to, to think about maybe using a different word. Because as, as I hope I've sort of suggested a little bit tonight, the history of the, the word blight and the idea of blight is deeply enmeshed with this history of racism and segregation. It's a word that's been used to harm neighborhoods as much as it's been used to help them. And so as uh, uh, Amy Kahn, who's uh, an attorney with the Garden Justice Legal Initiative at the Public Interest Law Center in Philadelphia, I'll just sort of... Uh, uh, endorse her words here and say that we're past the time to retire blight, not simply as a metaphor, but as a policy and legal framework for trying to rebuild cities. And so that's, uh, I think that uh, we've got lots of time for, uh, uh, for questions, as long as folks want to uh, stick around. But I can also understand that if you're like, uh, I've got my brain is full, uh, 
Um, you talked for like a solid 50 minutes in there, and, and uh, uh, my butt hurts, I want to go. So, so I, I'll give yourselves a round of applause for taking a weekday evening to discuss this stuff. And if there are, if there are questions, we can do questions as a, as a group uh, before we uh, uh, split up all together. So the question was um, whether the city has any plans to, to um, bring back the uh, uh, selling city-owned vacant buildings for a dollar, um, as they did in the sort of 1970s uh, uh, and early 1980s. So I don't think so. There has been uh, discussion at the city council. There was a, a bill put forward by uh, uh, council member Mary Pat Clark uh, that did get a couple of other um, sort of co-signers, but it didn't come with any kind of idea of funding attached. And one of the things that sometimes gets forgotten about the success of the Dollar House program is that those properties were actually acquired primarily for um, urban renewal or highway projects that didn't materialize. Um, and so the city already had all these sunk costs in, in the acquisition of those properties. And then in order to make those developments work, not um, uh, they both put a income and expenditure requirement on the people who were uh, getting the Dollar Houses, that they, they had to be able to secure like a $30,000 loan or something like that, which was not a small loan for um, the uh, the uh, uh, that period in time, um, and they. Uh, uh, with federal grants did substantial infrastructure improvements, especially in Otterbein and um, Berry Circle. So new gas lines, new electrical, a lot of the things where, um, where the neighborhoods needed that kind of infrastructure investment in order for reuse to be viable. And so while infrastructure is not quite the issue that it was in the late 1970s in those neighborhoods, it still remains a big issue um, uh, around replacement gas lines and water lines and other kinds of issues for, for the reuse of vacant houses. So, so it's probably not coming back soon. The uh, other questions? Oh, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I think they, the reason that I uh, haven't been talking about it so much is that it's um, uh, the share of neighborhoods that have uh, large numbers of vacant buildings and um, uh, increasing property values um, and a shrinking number of vacant buildings is actually a, rel a very small proportion of the overall to total. So there's many more neighborhoods with vacant buildings where the issues with vacancy are getting worse than neighborhoods with vacant buildings where there are uh, emerging issues around displacement uh, and housing affordability. So I think that it is something that is like I would love for folks to, to do more research and writing on that. It's just sort of not where I've decided to kind of focus. I think that Greenmount West and my own neighborhood of Harwood are two neighborhoods where that has been, uh, some of the questions have been playing out um, in part because of the, the tools that we have available to us right now. Um, and there's actually a variety of um, uh, uh, People come at the sort of housing affordability issues in uh, Baltimore from a variety of perspectives. Um, one consideration is that uh, uh, many folks argue that in cities um, with a large share of the population living in poverty, like Baltimore or Cleveland or Detroit or St. Louis, the problems that we have are not always a sort of like uh, affordable housing problem as much as it is a low wages problem or a sort of financial insecurity problem. Um, so the the um, the other question are, are the tools that we're using to promote the reuse and rehabilitation of vacant buildings sort of adversely affecting sort of housing markets in ways that result in uh, rising property values and a higher property tax costs on long established residents or rents or, or costs that uh, make it difficult for people who grew up in the neighborhood to buy into the neighborhood. So those, those are complicated issues that um, uh, uh, I think like sh we should be talking about more. We're just not talking a whole ton about them tonight. So the, uh, um, Yep, go ahead. 
so information about sort of how to uh, how to purchase a, a vacant building. So um, so I'd say there's a um, uh, to come back to the the uh, uh, a little bit some of some of the debate around gentrification. Um, uh, I think ties into some of the questions around um, uh, possible solutions, and I think that I could we could answer the question of like what what you can do to get involved in fixing up a vacant house, um, or we can get in uh, talk about the policies that could be in place that would help get a lot of people fixing up vacant houses. Um, one of the um, uh, uh, so the city's vacant to value program, which was established in 2015, the primary focus of that uh, uh, program in many ways has been to make it easier for people to purchase uh, vacant buildings that are owned by Baltimore City. Um, doing that both through a streamlined acquisition process that you can say that the city owns this, I'm gonna buy it and then I, I promise I'm gonna fix it up, or through uh, acquiring them from uh, delinquent private property owners through a process called receivership. So the receivership process is managed by a nonprofit called One House at a Time that holds monthly auctions. It's been a very effective tool at moving vacant buildings out of a bad situation into many times, but not all times, a better situation. It's a program that's most often receivership and sort of purchasing through receivership auctions is a program that's mostly used by small developers and builders because you have to commit that you're going to be mitigating that vacant building notice within a single year. Um, depending on the size and condition of the house, that could be a daunting prospect for someone who's looking for a DIY project. Um, uh, I think there's also a substantive difference in the condition of some of the vacant buildings that had been uh, involved in the Dollar House program had been vacant for a period of uh, five years or 10 years, some of the vacant buildings uh, in distressed market uh, areas in West and East Baltimore have been vacant for more like uh, 15 or 20. And so the physical condition of the structure is uh, beyond, uh, uh, beyond a DIY project for the most part. The other bigger policy issue here is that we still have the, some of the things that I didn't get to include for time's sake in the presentation is the history of persistent mortgage discrimination because that's sort of what redlining was, was it was a tool for, for just to enable the uh, systematic discrimination uh, to honestly force the systematic discrimination against black borrowers by uh, 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 banks. And that has been documented as uh, being a continuing issue through quantitative analysis, as well as sort of like reports and studies in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, like right now, is a continuing ongoing issue that I would have an easier time getting a mortgage because I'm a white guy than other folks might. So uh, um, that is a very big problem and we need to like, uh, I wish that our mayor was saying, uh, well, is going on with mortgage discrimination in Baltimore City instead of just like let's tear all this shit down because one without the other is not a solution. The, uh... So that was that was the figure in the 1930s. I'm trying to remember off. I think it's less than half, but it is definitely more than 10 percent. I think I want to guess is Peter. Do you, the 20, 20 to 25%, higher in some neighborhoods, lower in others. So, so, it's a, so the question is sort of like what there's, if there's a share of city owned vacant buildings in this whole other share of like, you know, three quarters of them that are not city owned, like what's going on with those? Why do they just sit? Why don't they get uh, fixed up? So one reason is that if someone doesn't feel like they can make any money now off the ownership of that building, uh, they might think that maybe I'll make money in the future if I just hang on to it. Um, sometimes there's sort of uh, uh, bandit signs that we mentioned uh, earlier. The real profit margin is to be a, a real estate investor, run seminars on real estate investment. Folks may recall the uh, Trump University uh, prior to the election. The, so is in a, in a 
whole category of training programs where uh, inexperienced uh, builders and investors are um, advised to purchase property, some of which might be owned even by the same folks who are running the, the seminar. And so to sell to the properties at inflated values to individuals who don't necessarily have the capital or experience to do something with it and who then um, end up getting stuck. Ultimately, though, one of the biggest reasons that houses are abandoned is uh, a, a family medical crisis. Someone can no longer live in the building, uh, whether because of the deteriorating condition or like uh, some change in medical status that they need to move. Their kids are scattered across the country. Um, uh, if they even have uh, descendants and a will that says the disposition. So there's a variety of scenarios in which uh, properties can get held up. The last, I guess, super big one would be that if they haven't been, they or a prior property owner has not been paying property taxes on the building, it has a large unpaid tax bill. I think the Baltimore Sun last year came out with a, uh, a study that identified there was one, one distressed vacant corner store that had 1.3 million dollar sort of unpaid tax bill associated with the property and that's that's if if baltimore city forgives that and says okay we're just taking this off the books what they're worried about is that their bond rating will go down and they won't be able to borrow money that goes to things like fixing up schools fixing up parks so it's a it's i mean it's the financial system at a national and international level works in such a way to make vacant buildings more difficult to fix up the uh Do you, would you credit that to changing household composition? I mean, shrinking household size is probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a, the, the way people make decisions about where to live and how to live and how we use the buildings that we live in are enormously complicated and sort of change all the time. So it's, uh, um, albeit changing gradually, so there were, Interesting. It's almost like they're doing it, and this is, I don't understand how that works. The lenders just won't do their small loans because they don't make money. Thank you. Steve, we've got another question in the far back, and then we'll come back up here. A, a good observation. Let's get a couple more questions uh, out just because I think we're almost out of time. 
thank you for for that. I will actually I'll pull up uh, um, the the GIS data for the um, uh, that I used on on that map. Let's see. We'll allow it to show show where we are here. Um, the uh, uh, it's gonna. To... Oh no! Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so if you are interested in um, getting a better uh, understanding of how the um, uh, HOLC maps were prepared and sort of how they came together, I can't recommend highly enough the uh, Mapping Inequality website, which is actually geo-referenced all of the HOLC redlining maps, traced them into GIS data, and digitized all of the actual surveyor forms, um, where you can read what each of the sort of inspectors we're writing about these uh, these areas. Um, let's get yes, and you can download them. So, uh, um, so go ahead. So the question was sort of why um, the uh, Baltimore has not experienced a sort of. Um, uh, uh, upturn again in sort of population growth, why population is, albeit much more slowly declining than it was uh, in the past, that it continues to decline and what strategies could be used to, to confront that. So, so that is the question that many uh, people in uh, Baltimore City government and institutions are, are asking. Um, one example of the kinds of solutions that are already in motion is uh, Live Baltimore. How many folks have been on a Live Baltimore tour, or been to one of their events before? At least a few folks, excellent. So Live Baltimore is a uh, neighborhood and home marketing uh, organization that was set up as a nonprofit, but is funded by Baltimore City primarily to, to market housing opportunities in Baltimore City to folks who are either live in the region somewhere else already or are sort of coming, moving to Baltimore. They do have have, if you're interested, back to the sort of how to make a difference, they actually have a uh, sort of neighbors, uh, what they call their neighbor know-it-all program, where you can register with them. So if someone wants to move to your neighborhood, but they've got questions about what it's like living in your neighborhood, you could be the person they talk to, and you could be like, here's what it's like. And then maybe they buy a house there, and it's one less vacant house for, for uh, you and your other neighbors to worry about. You've got a nice new neighbor. The uh, um, So that's, that's one example. I think that the uh, uh, biggest solutions to these issues, though, are likely going to be policy solutions uh, at the national level. I think the one thing that um, um, some folks still hold out hope for, I am uh, curious if I'll see it in my lifetime or not, is the end of the mortgage uh, interest uh, tax deduction, uh, which uh, means that people who have more large mortgages, whose houses are worth a good amount of money, who the interest that they pay on that they deduct for, from their taxes, which is to say, that our government subsidizes mortgages for people who uh, can afford to buy uh, nice, expensive houses, which is to say we are giving money to people who don't need it as much as people who really do need it. And so there, I think that without some substantial redistribution of how we use our public uh, funds, uh, um, it's going to be a difficult problem to solve. So the, the question was sort of like why Baltimore has had um, uh, uh, 
not perhaps stabilized or rebounded as much as some other cities like Washington, D.C. or Boston or New York, all of which had very serious vacant house problems, or even cities like Pittsburgh that has uh, uh, had a much slower sort of population loss. I think it does have a lot to do with the, um, the way in which race has always been, race and racial segregation has been central to the construction of housing policy in the Baltimore region to an extent that it has been less so in some other cities, especially West Coast cities, because the um, Baltimore, just as a for instance, had the largest free black population of any city in the South uh, uh, prior to the Civil War, I think was second only in like total population to I want to say either New York or Philadelphia. The uh, um, I think Philadelphia. So, but so there was a very large uh, uh, black population in Baltimore in the mid 19th century, and people uh, who were very committed to white people who were very committed to racial segregation and uh, devoted a great deal of time and creativity to figuring out how to, how to um, do that, including moving from the Roland Park company, with developer of Guilford and Roland Park and Homeland, two jobs at the Federal Housing Administration, two jobs with the National Association of Realtors, and in other ways, sort of Baltimore being a actually relatively important source of influence on some of those national housing policies in the 20th century. There's um, a, a, a blanket on, um, I can't believe I'm not recalling her name right off the top of my head, but there's an excellent scholar who recently got her PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins who's done extensive research on the uh, ties between the um, Roland Park Company and sort of British colonial money. And so like sort of white supremacy has always functioned as this sort of global phenomenon. So um, the uh, uh, let's get uh, one last question in the back and then I think that we'll, we'll uh, uh, I'll be happy to stick around and answer more questions. The, have you all been like with a hand raised behind the pillar for, for a while or? Uh, the, well, okay, well then we'll do that last question in the back and then we'll, um, I'll stick around so anybody who uh, has more questions can come up after. So the question was sort of like, what are some uh, perhaps more radical or considered radical alternatives to either these sort of like very local incentive programs which can reinforce existing patterns of inequality or these sort of federal policies which we are sort of uh, until we get um, um, uh, new uh, congressional representation and a new president, we're unlikely to see sort of like good changes to federal policy around housing. So um, the I think the um, uh, there are locally who are doing organizing and advocacy work around co-housing, around community land trusts. Um, uh, uh, and I think that the advocacy campaign that went into the uh, the now uh, com this Baltimore city is committed to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which in and of itself is like a relatively radical solution in this uh, uh, day and age. The uh, um, so the. I feel like folks are exploring it. The, I think that there's also a lot of like just individual precarity and uncertainty of sort of like how to make a difference around such a big issue and uh, uh, whether it's possible for individuals or neighborhood groups to, to make a difference around uh, these issues. Um, the, I'll uh, point to as another example, the um, uh, uh, Scott Wizig was a very large investor, uh, real estate owner who lived in Houston and owned hundreds of uh, largely vacant and distressed buildings in Baltimore City. The Community um, Law Center supported a coalition of uh, affected neighborhood organizations, took them to court, 
sued him uh, to uh, try to get him to clean up those properties. It was eventually ordered by the court that he clean up. He ultimately ended up demolishing a very substantial number of the, the properties that he owned, including properties that some of those neighborhood groups probably would have preferred that he not demolished. But it was, for him, the cheapest and easiest way of making his legal problems go away. Um, unfortunately, even with that large of a judgment and decision against him, he's still in operation. Um, and, uh, and of course, his, his business sort of often is not uh, you know, it's. I guess it's for some folks. It's only against the law if you get caught. So, uh, um, so I think that there's need for enforcement and advocacy and monitoring in, in all kinds of situations. So, so thank you all very much. I really appreciate you spending the time with me tonight. Have a great uh, and I'll stick around. Later.